Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Now, as we begin our study of this, um, what has become a controversial chapter, let me tell you that I did not orchestrate this. I didn't think six years ago when I began Romans, oh, this will be perfect. There'll be a pandemic and there'll be a lot of debate about what government should and shouldn't do, and so that'll be, that'll be great. I didn't do that. The Lord has done this, and uh, it's for our benefit and blessing as we look at this text together. I thought about where to start, and what I don't want you to do this morning as we begin is to think about the current state in our own country, the current political climate that has fractured our nation. Instead, what I want you to do for a moment is step away with me and let me see if I can create a country in your imagination. I want you to imagine that you live in a country where all of the politicians come only from wealthy families. And I want you to think about the current leader, and let's imagine for a moment that this current leader is very young. He has no experience. He has only his family's pedigree to offer. He has come to power under questionable circumstances. In fact, the rumor is circulating that his mother may have poisoned his predecessor. Once in power, this man begins to unravel the society. He begins by abolishing and banning capital punishment. He, he reduces taxes without reducing government expenditures, and he begins to spend wildly, especially on the arts. It becomes increasingly known that this young leader has a dark side. Word spreads that he's involved with married women, and even worse, with young boys. In fact, word gets out that he has decided to marry his male companion. He flaunts his power by completely ignoring the other government leaders. He's implicated even in several plots and murders of a number of innocent people, including, as it turns out, even his own mother. And it turns out that eventually that he actually hates Christianity. He begins to attack it. He begins to persecute its leaders. He rules for many years, and after basically destroying the country and emptying its coffers, he's run out of office by other officials, and he ends his short, dark life with suicide. If you lived in such a place, and if you lived under such a ruler, how would you as a Christian respond? As perhaps you've already guessed, there was such a country and there was such a ruler. It was Rome and the ruler was Nero. That was the government and that was the leader under which Paul, a Roman citizen, lived and it was the same government and the same leader in which he wrote to the Christians in Rome, the capital of the empire and the seat of Rome's power, it was the Washington, D.C. of the empire. That, my friends, is the context of Romans 13. It's important for us to understand exactly what things were like. If you want the good old days, there they are. We find ourselves in the fourth and final major section of the book of Romans. Let me just remind you, this fourth section I've entitled The Gospel Applied. This this book is about the gospel. Paul has explained the gospel, he's defended the gospel, he's applied the gospel now in these verses, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, and this will run all the way to chapter 15, verse 13. In this final section, before his closing, Paul ends his letter by applying the truth of the gospel that he has explained so beautifully, but applying it very practically. Now, here's the outline as we have discovered so far of this last major section. 
The first two verses of chapter 12 describe a gospel response to God. You are to offer God your body and your mind. They are His, purchased by the blood of His Son, and this is to be your response to Him. In verses 3 through 8 of chapter 12, we saw a gospel response to service. That is, you have been gifted by Christ to serve in His church, and you are to do so. That is to be the commitment of your life. Now, in the preliminary outline that I gave you a number of months ago, I broke the rest of chapter 12 into a response to believers and a response to enemies. But as we have studied that passage together, I've concluded that it's really one large section on the priority expressions of love, both love for God and love for others, as we've learned together. So I have changed the outline that I originally gave you to this. You have in chapter 12, verses 9 to 21, a gospel response to love. Today, we begin chapter 13 and a new theme, and it is a gospel response to government. Here's how a life that has been overpowered by, overcome by the gospel, responds to the government under which the person lives. Let's read it together. Romans chapter 13, and I'll begin reading in verse 1 down through verse 7. You follow along. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil." Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, this is one of those passages where the Apostle Paul doesn't leave us wondering exactly what the theme is. In fact, he states it very clearly in the first sentence of this paragraph. Notice, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. In other words, this paragraph is a gospel response to government. Now, why does, he, why does he change to this theme? There's been a lot of discussion about this in commentaries, and those who are uncomfortable with what Paul says here, some of them have even rejected that these words are Paul's. There's no basis for doing so whatsoever. It appears in all the manuscripts. So what is the connection? Well, the likely connection of this paragraph with what goes before is probably back in chapter 12, verse 19, where we are told not to take personal vengeance for wrongs that we suffer. So here, Paul reminds us that even though that is true, it doesn't mean that God doesn't care about justice in the world. He does. God is a God of justice. Justice is the very foundation of His throne of His rule. Instead of personal vengeance, however, God brings about justice and wrath through the governing authorities on all of those who do evil. Now, this is a truly remarkable paragraph. I have spent countless hours reading in preparation for the study of this paragraph, not just in my shelf of commentaries on Romans, but in many other books as well. 
this remarkable paragraph either directly addresses or indirectly raises questions about these crucial issues. Listen to them. These are the issues that are raised here. The fundamental principle of human authority, the various structures of human authority, the different forms of human government, the divine purposes for human government, God's sovereign control of individual governmental officials, the relationship between church and state is raised here, the validity of capital punishment, the validity and reasons for a just war, or is there such a thing? Our responsibilities or duties to government as individual Christians, and the biblical exceptions for submission to government, while not mentioned here, certainly this passage raises that question. Those are all issues that are either here directly or are raised indirectly by this passage. And you need to know, I plan to address all of those as we walk through this passage together. Let me give you a working outline of this paragraph. You have, first of all, the very first sentence Verse 1 begins with a universal command to submit to government. That is followed then, beginning right after the first sentence and running all the way down through verse 6, with the reasons to submit to government. So you have the universal command to submit to government and the first part of verse 1, then beginning after that, running down through verse 6, you have the reasons to submit to government, and then in verse 7, you have the, the components, the, the elements, or, or the expressions of submission to government. What does that look like to submit to government? So today, we want to begin, and we want to begin where Paul does, with a universal command to submit to government. Look again at verse 1 and the beginning of that verse. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, let me just begin by saying this. When it comes to the Christian response to this passage and to government, sadly, most Christians tend to end up on one of two extremes. One extreme is to focus solely on Romans 13 as the entire Christian response to government. In other words, some take this passage in isolation from the rest of Scripture and imagine that we owe a mindless, unlimited obedience to those at all levels of government. These people who who take this extreme, they'll refuse to speak out against the, the sins of government and its officials. They will even obey the government when its commands are contrary to the clear teaching of Scripture. They assume that there's no legitimate place for disagreement, for petition, for peaceful protest, or at times even for disobedience of the government and its laws. Folks, we have to interpret this passage in consistency with the rest of Scripture. This is a basic principle of biblical interpretation. Scripture interprets Scripture. Have you heard that expression? That's using the word Scripture in two different ways. Let me put it to you this way. What that really is saying, when you hear Scripture interpret Scripture, what it means is the entirety of Scripture, the overall message of Scripture, the rest of what Scripture says helps us interpret any given passage of Scripture. And that's something we must do here as well. So there's one extreme, and that is to take Romans 13 as the end-all, be-all. There's nothing else God has to say about this issue. The second extreme is to focus on the exceptions to Romans 13. Essentially, there are people, there are Christian people who say, yeah, yeah, Romans 13 is fine, but let me tell you the rights I have. Some Christians spend their time trying to find new legitimate ways that they can disobey the government. Frankly, for them, they're only going to obey this passage If their government is perfect, if their government is truly Christian, if it's ruled by just rulers, and if the laws of the land reflect the Scripture. 
Folks, there is no such government, and there won't be until Christ rules on this planet. These Christians are often suspicious by nature. They are suspicious of every official. They are suspicious of every law. They are quickly combative, and they are consistently critical in what they say and write and post about the government. Some of them even become mean-spirited and belligerent, even encouraging rebellion and revolution. How do you know if you're tempted in this direction? Well, just look at what you spend your time reading and following when it comes to this issue of government. Look at what you like. Look at what you post. If the majority of it leans in this direction, then you have fallen onto or into this extreme. The focus, let me say it this bluntly, the focus of your response to government does need to be Romans 13 and the other passages where you learn that you are to submit to government, you are to pray for your leaders, you're to pay your taxes, you're to respect and honor those in positions of authority, and you're to live a quiet and peaceable life. So as we consider these two extremes, I want to begin, as I often do, with what this passage is not teaching, with what it does not mean. And therefore, I want to begin with what I will call the biblical exceptions, the biblical exceptions. Before we look at this passage, I want to step away for a minute and admit that the Bible has some other things to say. Romans 13 is not all the Bible has to say about government and our response to it. There are biblical exceptions to the demand here to submit to government. There are biblical grounds to disobey our leaders. You say, Tom, why would you start there? Well, I want to start there for two reasons. First of all, because it of those two extremes. There are Christians who read Romans 13 and conclude that we owe our government unlimited obedience, and that is simply not true, and you need to know that. I also want to begin here, the second reason I want to start with the exceptions, is because there are those who will find it very hard to hear what Paul actually teaches here in Romans 13 if I don't start with the exceptions. Because you're going to be sitting there saying, well, yeah, yeah, Tom, I hear you, but what about? And so I want to get the what abouts off the table so we can come to Romans 13 and let the Lord speak through His Word. So what are the biblical exceptions to submission to government? What are the biblical grounds for disobeying government? What are the primary legitimate ways for Christians to respond to government abuses? We live in a fallen, imperfect world. There are and will be governmental abuses of power. How are Christians to respond? Well, let me start with the legitimate response by individuals to government officials. In other words, for us as individual Christians, how are we responsible or how can we respond legitimately to those abuses? What are the legitimate ways we can respond to those things? Number one, and I'm going to go through a little list here. First of all, we can acknowledge, it's okay to acknowledge and even to graciously speak against the sins and legal abuse of our leaders. There are countless examples, of course, in the Old Testament as the prophets of God speak against the kings of Israel. The prophets, of course, were, were in an office for that reason. That was, their, that was their purpose. You see it expressed, for example, in Daniel chapter 5. You remember in Daniel chapter 5, uh, Daniel is brought in to confront Belshazzar because of the handwriting on the wall and to explain what has been written. And Daniel says this, you, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart even though you knew all that happened to your actually grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, 
but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and your ways, you have not glorified. Folks, it is okay to say that someone in leadership is in a pattern of sin, that they are not someone to emulate because of their lifestyle and choices, because of their responses. You do so graciously, but to do so, to acknowledge it in your own mind, and to even say that is not a, a disregard for what Romans 13 teaches. I mean, Look at Jesus' response to the Jewish leadership of the first century, the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. Now, granted, this is a little muddy because it was was both religious and civic authority. So, let me give you a different example. Here's Mark 6, verse 18. This is John the Baptist talking to Herod. So, John the Baptist is now talking about a secular leader he had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So, obviously, it's acceptable for believers to acknowledge and graciously speak against the sins and even the legal abuse of their leaders. Secondly, it is legitimate for us as individual believers to request a personal exception from the law. If the law is asking us to do that, which we cannot in good conscience do, it's legitimate for us to essentially petition. That's what it amounts to. Daniel does this in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. He was, you you remember, again, in a pagan culture, ruled over by a pagan king, and he was supposed to eat food that he was not supposed to eat as a follower of God. And there are a lot, there's a lot of debate about what that was. You can pick up with our study of Daniel if you'd like to and learn more about it. But in the end, this is what Daniel did, Daniel 1.8. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. You say, well, what if, what if the commander had said, nope, you've got to eat it anyway, what would he have done? Well, I think we see that later, and we'll get there in a minute. But he started with a petition. He started with a request for an exception to be made. Thirdly, it's okay for believers to use all legal means provided by existing law. In other words, it's not wrong for you as a Christian to use the means that the laws of our land grant us. How do I know that? Because Jesus and the Apostle Paul did this. It's okay to lawfully protest unjust or illegal treatment and to insist that the country's laws be followed. Listen to Jesus in in John 18, verses 21 to 23. It's in the first trial before Annas on that that early Friday morning just before the crucifixion. And it was a hearing of sorts. And in that hearing, Annas probes Jesus for self-incriminating testimony. This was against the law. And so Jesus says, why do you question me? Jesus is saying, look, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're not supposed to be asking me to incriminate myself. Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? See, on two different occasions in that one conversation, Jesus appeals to the law. He says, This is wrong. You you cannot question me in this hearing. You need to bring witnesses and not ask me to say something that's self-incriminating. It wasn't allowed by Jewish law. And in addition, he was struck against Jewish law, and he questions it. He says, if I've said something wrong, tell me, but otherwise, don't strike me illegally. It's okay for us to appeal to existing law to correct 
unjust or illegal treatment and insist that the laws of the country be followed. Paul does this uh, on several occasions. When he was unjustly arrested and beaten in Philippi, in Acts 16, verse 37, Paul said to them, you remember they, they beat him, he was in the prison all night, you remember the earthquake, he's set free, the jailer comes to Christ, but the next morning, um, they just want to sort of get Paul to leave quietly, just, just go away. And Paul says to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they're sending us away secretly? No, I don't think so. Let them come themselves and bring us out. What was Paul doing? He wasn't being belligerent. He was saying, this is contrary to the law. The law needs to be followed, and, and they need to own up to the fact that the law has been broken. When he was unlawfully threatened with punishment, contrary to Roman law, you remember with, when that whole scene unfolded in Jerusalem, in, in Acts 22, verse 25, they stretched him out with thongs to beat him, and Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Of course, it wasn't. What Paul was doing is he was saying, this is illegal, this is wrong. And when Paul was unlawfully struck at a hearing before the Sanhedrin in Acts 23, verse 3, Paul said to the one who struck him, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck, talking to the high priest? It's in violation of the law. You have no right to strike me. That's not what the law allows. The point I'm trying to make here is that both Jesus our Lord and the Apostle Paul didn't do it belligerently. They didn't do it in a way that, that would in any way compromise their personal integrity or their, their, their reputation as, as those who follow God, but they felt perfectly free to say, this is wrong, this is illegal. Look at what the law says. And it's okay for us to do so as well. We can also use the judicial system to pursue justice and the following of the country's laws. It exists for that purpose. Paul did this. Again, you remember that he, he was standing uh, at, at, a, at a Roman hearing and, and in an effort just to sort of sweep the whole thing under the rug and satisfy the Jewish authorities. He was just going to be given over to them. And Acts 25, verses 10 and 11, Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I'm a Roman citizen. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar, which was a legal remedy for Roman citizens to say, there is injustice taking place, and I appeal to Caesar for my case to be heard. So it's okay for us as believers to use the judicial system to pursue justice and the following of the country's laws. We can also use, and this is unique to us, it wasn't true necessarily in Rome, but we can use the legislature to seek the change of laws. We can use the voting box to replace politicians responsible for unjust or illegitimate laws. So don't think for a moment that we can't use existing law to deal with these issues. We as Christians are free to do so. And both our Lord and the Apostle Paul set an example of that. Let me give you a couple of more legitimate responses that we can make to government abuses. Number four, we can flee unlawful and unjust arrest and punishment. We can flee unlawful and unjust arrest and punishment. Jesus commanded this of his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. Whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. He says it's okay for you to flee. That persecution came from the local authorities. It came from the synagogue. 
and it was okay for them to flee. Jesus himself, of course, did this with the Sanhedrin. You remember after the raising of Lazarus, they had decided to put Jesus to death. And John 11, verses 53 and 54 say, from that day they planned together to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples, obviously until the time was right. But he felt it was perfectly legitimate to avoid the governmental authorities with an unjust arrest and punishment. The Apostle Paul did the same thing in Acts 9, verse 23 and Verses 23 to 25, when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together. Again, these are the the Jewish leaders, the authorities. They plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Sadly, there are Christians in our world today in persecuted places where such things have to happen, and that's acceptable before the Lord. One final one, and this is the one you've kind of been waiting for and wondered why I haven't gotten there yet, and that is to disobey the government only when they require you to break God's law. And by the way, you have to be careful here. This isn't if there's some question, some doubt. This is if you can point to a chapter and verse command that they are making you break. And even then, you're required to do so with the right spirit and with a willingness to patiently suffer the consequences of your disobedience, as Jesus did in trusting yourself, 1 Peter 2, to the one who judges righteously. You know the text, but turn there with me, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And you remember that verse 18, the the Sanhedrin summoned the disciples together, verse 18, and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, there is a command by government to do something that if they obeyed the government, they would be disobeying God directly. They had been called to deliver the message of the gospel. And so, verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. We have a choice between obeying you and obeying God. We must obey God. In chapter 5, it's put even clearer. Verse 28, the council And the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. There's the mandate for us as believers. When we are called upon by government either to do what God forbids or we are forbidden to do what God commands. Either way, when we're called upon by government to act contrary to a clear chapter and verse command of Scripture, then we must obey God rather than men. Of course, the Scripture is filled with other examples. In Exodus chapter 1, you remember Pharaoh told the, the Jewish midwives to kill the male children that were born. And it says in Exodus 1, 16 and 17, And when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Because their putting those boys to death is a direct violation of the law of God. Daniel is a great example of this in in his book in two ways. First of all, with his friends in Daniel chapter 3, Verse 18, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded by the king to fall down and worship in front of the image, and their response to him in Daniel 3.18 was, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Why? Because to do so would have been a direct violation of a clear command of Scripture. 
Daniel himself modeled this in Daniel chapter 6. You remember that his enemies, in order to, uh, to get him removed from power, created this scenario, and they got the king uh, Darius to go along to say, listen, make a decree that no one will pray to anyone but you. You'll be the intermediary. You'll be the, the, the mediator between God and man for these next few weeks. And anyone who does that, who, does in, who prays to anyone other than you, will be put to death, given to the lions. Verse 10 of chapter 6 of Daniel says, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. So understand then that there are exceptions. But notice our exceptions as individuals are limited in Scripture. Don't miss this. Just because we live in what has now become a democracy doesn't mean God has given you as an individual authority over those in authority. These are the exceptions. And even these must be carried out without sinning in your speech or in your attitude. You must reflect the same disposition and spirit Daniel did and not that that's all too common. So let's go into a second category. That's the legitimate response by individuals to government abuses. But I want to give you one more category that maybe you haven't thought about, the legitimate response by subordinate authorities in government to government abuses. The Reformers and Puritans used to refer to these as the lesser magistrates, the lesser magistrates. What they meant by that was lower government officials. So here are people who have been placed by God, as we'll learn in in Romans 13, into positions of authority and power. It's not the supreme one. It's not the king, the emperor, the president, the prime minister, but it's somewhere down the line in positions of authority. I believe that the Reformers were right when they, they insisted that these lesser magistrates, these lower government officials, have responsibilities beyond that of individual citizens. Why? Because they have been placed into these positions of human authority and government, as we'll learn, by God, and therefore they serve as ministers of God. They have an authority you don't have, and I don't have. So what can they do in response to government government abuses? First of all, obviously, they're individuals, so they can use all the means available to individuals that we just walked through. Okay, they're not limited. They can use those. But beyond that, secondly, they can disobey when laws or executive orders will unjustly cause the death of innocents, and there are no other means to avert it. Esther is a great example of this. In Esther chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Esther told them to say to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, and fast for me, and do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, listen to this, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Why? Because she was going to try to save innocent life. What this says to us, folks, is Christians can never take the Nazi tact at the Nuremberg trials and say, I was just following orders. Thirdly, lesser magistrates or those in subordinate authority can disobey when the laws or executive orders are contrary to the law of the land. In other words, it doesn't have to be just contrary to the law of God. They can disobey when it's contrary to the law of the land. Why? Because they took an oath to uphold the law of the land, to do justice, and to protect their people. Number four, they can resist with force an unlawful internal takeover of the government. In other words, a coup. Lesser government officials, those who have been placed in positions of authority by God, have the right to act against an unlawful takeover of the government. And then fifthly, they can remove with force, if necessary, any government official who seeks to replace the current government and its laws. In other words, somebody who is now intent on changing everything and becoming 
uh, something other than the law allows, whether it's a tyrant, dictator, whatever it might be. Again, why is this? Why do they have this right and I don't? It's because of the actual or implied oath that they took to the law of the land and to its people and to the fact that God, as we'll see in Romans 13, has placed them in those positions of authority to do what's right. Now, biblically, folks, those are the exceptions to our required submission to government. But can I tell you, please be careful. Be careful with these. It's like... It's like um, a knife. If you're using a knife, you can use it in the proper way, but you better be careful not to cut yourself. I did that this week, actually, on my wrist. Be careful. As you think about and weigh the exceptions for submitting to government, make sure that you guard, first of all, your attitude. We're going to look more at Titus 3 in coming weeks, but Titus 3 Verses 1 and 2 says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, and this is all under the same heading, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration or courtesy to all men. That includes those in positions of authority. If your attitude toward local, state, and federal government officials is not one of honor and respect you are sinning against God. Even if you are pursuing a legitimate biblical response to government, if your speech, your attitude, or your posts are characterized by viciousness or even constant suspicion and disrespect, you are sinning against those officials and ultimately against God Himself. As one writer put it, while disobedience is possible, insubordination is not. Also, beware not only of your attitude as you think about these exceptions, but beware of your, of your focus. Your focus. You know, it's interesting that while the Bible contains those legitimate exceptions to the commands to submit to government, not one of the three primary New Testament passages about our responsibility to government gives one of those exceptions. In other words, all three of the primary New Testament passages say, Submit with no qualification. Why is that? It doesn't mean there aren't any exceptions. What it does mean is that the limited number of exceptions and the relative obscurity of most of them serve to magnify the rule of submission. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, think about this. What would you think of a Christian wife who spent most of her marriage researching the biblical grounds for not submitting to her husband? and for biblical divorce? What if she talked about those biblical exceptions constantly? What if the websites that that she gravitated to online and, and, and read most were about the biblical grounds for not submitting to her husband? And what if most of her posts championed her right not to submit and her right to divorce under certain circumstances? What's wrong with that? I mean, if it's what the Scriptures teach, she's not technically wrong, but we just inherently know that's not right. Why? Because the focus is desperately wrong. If she's dominated by the exceptions that allow her not to submit to her husband and not to stay married, then she's missed the entire point of what the Bible teaches about the priority of marriage. Sadly, This is true of many Christians when it comes to their submission to government. They focus their entire attention on the exceptions. Listen, folks, those are exceptions, not the rule. And in Romans 13, Paul focuses his attention not on the biblical exceptions, but let's consider the biblical rule. Just look briefly with me at verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Every person in Greek is literally every soul. Why does Paul put it that way? Well, it's a Hebrew expression, and it means everyone without exception, both believers and unbelievers. Every person. 
Now, notice the word authorities. Just like in English, the word authority can be used of the possession of power, but it can also be used of the person who exercises that power authority, and that's how it's used here in the plural. In fact, it's clear who these authorities are. Some, some interpreters have tried to say, well, these are like, um, these are demons. Um, these, are, these are those kinds of powers or authorities. And the word is used that way in other places in the New Testament. But here, Paul defines what he means. In verse 3, in a parallel expression, he talks about rulers. So, these authorities are rulers who have positions in the government. Josephus uses this word of the Roman authorities in Judea. Now, notice the the adjective governing, governing authorities. That simply means those who are over, those who are in a position over others, and specifically the Christians to whom Paul writes. So, understand then that these governing authorities are simply government officials at all different levels. As Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14, submit yourselves to the Lord, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to the king as the one in the, the sort of supreme ultimate authority or to governors as sent by him and everyone else. The point is all of those who have a position of authority in the government. In our context, The governing authorities would include the president, the executive branch, Congress, judges, governors, mayors, and even policemen. Now, we'll talk more about the fact that that these officials are placed by God. They may abuse their authority, and they need to be addressed for abusing their authority, but nevertheless, the, the concept of authority, the fact of authority, and even those who currently rule in authority are placed there by God. We'll, again, we'll talk about the factors involved in that, Lord willing, next week. Notice Paul does not say only the good and the righteous and the respectable. John Calvin puts it this way, we are not only subject to the authority of princes who perform their office toward us uprightly and faithfully as they ought, but also to the authority of all who perform not a whit of the prince's office. They who rule unjustly and incompetently have been raised up by God to punish the wickedness of the people. A wicked man should be held in the same reverence and esteem by his subjects insofar as public obedience is concerned in which they would hold the best of kings if he were given to them." End quote. Now, the Greek word translated be in subjection means to willingly submit to another, to recognize their authority over you. This is a military word. It's often used in military contexts for the response of those lower in the command structure to those who are higher in the command structure. Although the words be in subjection does not in and of itself mean obey, It is often linked with obedience. For example, in Titus chapter 3, verse 1, we are to be in subjection and to obey in that text. Two other New Testament texts teach this priority. As I said, we'll be looking at them in more detail over the coming weeks. One of them is Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The other is 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. Look again at verse 1. Every soul is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, let me ask you, how do you know? How do you know if you have a truly submissive heart toward the government? Let me give you a little test. And I challenge you, as I've challenged myself this week, to be really honest with yourself. If your kids, or if you don't have kids, imagine that you did, If your kid spoke to and about you the way you speak to and about the government, would you say that they are submitting? If your kids had the attitude toward you and your authority that you have toward the government's authority, would you say that they are submissive? 
If your kids acted toward you in the way you act toward the government, would you say they have a submissive heart toward your authority? If you honestly have to say the answer is no, then understand this, you do not have a submissive heart toward the government that God Himself has established, and you are living in a pattern of unrepentant sin. Let me challenge us all as we begin our journey through this chapter that we will allow our Lord to speak to our hearts through His Word, that we will think like Christians first and foremost, above everything else. Next time, Lord willing, we'll begin to consider the reasons that we're to submit to government. Let's pray together. Father, use Your Word, use our time together. Lord, grant us the wisdom to have the right balance. Thank You that that You have given us exceptions, that there are ways we can legitimately respond to the abuses of government. And yet, Father, I pray that you would help us to have the right attitude and to have the right focus and to really focus our attention not on the exceptions but on the rule. And, Lord, if we have been disrespectful, if we have not honored those in authority, if we have lived in anger and suspicion, Lord, forgive us and help us to obey your Word and to live as believers in this world. We pray that we would reflect these clear commands. Help us to understand more as we walk through this passage together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.